we are about to get some very valuable information about what it means and how we can be a good witness for Jesus. The Bible teaches that everywhere you go as a genuine Christian, that you are no longer representing yourself, but you are now representing Christ. It's not you, Paul said, it's Christ that lives in me. And you now represent him. And in this chapter, we see Paul and Silas, but specifically Paul, representing Christ wherever he goes. And this idea of being a witness, of sharing your faith, of letting people know you're a believer is easier than you think. I just want to get that out front right away. It's easier than you think. People have made it too complicated. They've laid too much on you. They're asking you to do what only God can do, but we can do what God asks us to do. This is incredibly powerful, and I really believe that it is going to be valuable. The Bible teaches that you and I as Christians are ambassadors for Christ, which is a pretty incredible privilege. Think about that. We are called ambassadors. I'm an ambassador for heaven on earth, but so are you. you. You've been given the office of an ambassador. And what does an ambassador do? He represents the country he's from. And so we are representing the kingdom of God in heaven in eternity here on earth as a Christian. That's amazing. Listen to where Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 20. He says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We're ambassadors for Christ as if Christ is working through us, saying to people, be reconciled to him. And each of us has that. Now, can you imagine a country sending out an ambassador, not equipping them, not providing for them, not empowering them and giving them authority to do what they've been called to do. God hasn't sent you out without equipping you, empowering you, and giving you what you need to be a good ambassador for Christ wherever you go. He's given you all of that. Let me give you some examples of that. Number one, wherever you go, the Holy Spirit that is in you flows out of you like a river we can't see and into the room where we are so that everybody is being influenced by the Spirit of God by you just being there. When you walk into a room, family, friends, co-workers, acquaintances, the Holy Spirit's there with you and they're being convinced and convicted and worked on by the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Jesus said in John 7, 37 and 39. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, which we know is salvation, right? Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So when you believe in him, out of you flows rivers of living water. And those rivers of living water that are overflowing in your life and into the lives of people around you is the Spirit. So that sometimes, sometimes people will say to me, I'm sick of you preaching at me. I haven't said a word yet. I was going to. But it's only because as I am there, we don't see in the spiritual realm that God is equipping us as ambassadors to be able to do our job. We are not alone. The very spirit of the living God is with you everywhere you are. Now that's not all. The spirit also empowers you. Not only does he flow out of you and he's affecting, he's convincing. The Bible says the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit's with you. He will be in you. And he convinces the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So he's already at work within them. That's why when we as Christians will get, we'll get accused of judging people because the Holy Spirit's convicting people of their sin, of righteousness, that it's available, and of judgment if you don't repent. That the Holy Spirit's doing that. 
but also the Holy Spirit empowers you. Here's what Jesus said to his disciples in Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the world. I got to think from Jerusalem, Tucson's the end of the world. And he's promised that we're going to be empowered. In other words, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, is going to bring to your remembrance the things I've told you. Have you ever been witnessing to someone and suddenly you're remembering scriptures? All of a sudden you're, you're sharing, you're thinking, this is good. This isn't me normally. Normally I'm petrified. That's the empowering of the Holy Spirit. God opens up a door for you to be able to share. We're not asking you to kick open a door. We're not asking you to be in a conversation with somebody about, I don't know, the new electric car that's on the, that's out and they want to buy. And you're like, well, electric cars are great, but have you received Jesus as your savior? We're not asking you to do that. We believe God's at work getting things ready for people to be able to hear what you want to share. Now, not only are you ambassadors that has the Holy Spirit with you, that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, when he told us that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and you don't light a light to put it under a basket, right? That's what he said. You light a light to be seen. So God hasn't set you on fire for him to cover you up with a basket. Take the basket off. When you were a kid, this is a light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a basket. Bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. So this is what Jesus said after he said, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. Let your light shine so before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When you, as an individual, care for those that are in need, elderly, homeless, impoverished, strug people are struggling physically, sick, and you show compassion and care for them, not so you can be puffed up in what you do, but so that God gets the glory, people see God glorified and they're more attracted to what we're doing. This is why Jesus said, if you give a glass of water in my name, you won't lose your reward. We're not asked to do anything we can't do. We're just asked to help people who are suffering. That's why the Bible says, if you give to the poor, you're lend to God and God will repay. God's encouraging us to be a part of that. So as we're moving through the world, and by the way, Christianity as a whole does more to help needy people worldwide and in America than any other organization. And by the way, that's like two to one. We, we Christians give twice as much as any other organization that is out there in helping those that are struggling. Why do we do that? Because that's just in us. The Spirit of God's in us. And God cares about those who are needy. God cares for those who are struggling. And as we do that, it becomes part of our evangelism. They people see, see they glorify God. They're more interested in God when we are caring for those who are needy. Now, not only that, the Bible also tells us that our job is to plant and water, and God gives the increase. We're not asking you to get anybody saved. And this is not one of those sermons that you might hear where people are talking about witnessing for Christ, where they get to the point where they say, you've never led anybody to Jesus. You awful, horrible Christian. Shame on you. They gomer pile you. Shame, shame, shame. Those of you old enough, you're going to remember that, right? They gomer pile you. But here's the thing. They're laying a trip on you you can't carry. You can't get someone saved. I can't get someone saved. I haven't saved a person in all my life. As a, 38 years as a pastor, I've never saved one person. God has. The story is told of Billy Graham being on a plane. And there's a guy who's drunk on the plane. And that does happen, by the way. <laughs> Why they don't cut him off, I have no idea. There's a drunk person on the plane. And he sees Billy Graham. And he says, Billy, I just wanted to say that, that, that you saved me. And Billy Graham said, well, I must have saved you because God didn't. <laughs> Billy Graham realized that he didn't save anybody. He spoke to more people live in person than anyone else in history. Probably never be broken because of, of the way things are done now with, you know, people, all the different internet things that happen. But he said, I never brought anybody to Christ. 
And here's where we get that from. This is, this is 1 Corinthians 3, 6. Paul speaking. I planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. Your job and what I'm asking you to do today as spirit-filled ambassadors for Christ is to plant seeds and water seeds and let God give the increase. This is a farming analogy. No one better to learn it from than a guy whose last name is Furrow. <laughs> that you're learning a farming analogy. I was also born in Clinton, Iowa in farming country. My family had farms. And when a, when a farmer plants, he's gotta be patient. He doesn't plant a seed, water it, and harvest it in the same day. Why do you think that's gonna happen with you? Why are you discouraged when you're planting seeds and watering and the person doesn't come to Christ for a couple of years? Don't get discouraged. It takes time. And the process of that person growing into a Christian who is harvested by God takes, it's, it's, it's unknown. I could tell you a lot of farmers have no idea how the plant they planted grows. They, they cannot tell you the scientific aspect of how it happens. People who don't farm can. The farmers are, I don't know, I plant the seed in the ground and it grows. I water, I fertilize, it grows. That's what we're to do. This is why I said in the beginning of this study, this is easier than you think. If you hear that I'm going to bring you a message about you shining for Christ and being a witness for him, and you think that I'm going to get to the point that you have to give them a hard sell, you're wrong. I don't have to give people a hard sell. You know what the hard sell is, right? It's when you're on the car lot and you're just looking at a car and the salesman says, how do you want to finance this? Do you have a bank you want to go through? I'm like, my car broke down. I'm not even looking at cars. I was just passing through. You're asking me if I want to finance it? No, I don't want to finance it. I don't ever have to say, do you want to give your life to Christ? Now, I do that, and I've been shocked to see people respond. When I used to do marriage counseling, because people have to do marriage counseling in order to be married at Calvary. So I realized that we get people in that don't really know the Lord. They're, they're marrying somebody who grew up in the church and maybe they've committed their lives to Christ or maybe they didn't. So I would, at the end of the first session, I don't do marriage counseling anymore, by the way. We have people who do, but I don't do it anymore. But I would say to them at the end of the first session, would you like to receive Jesus as your savior? Just kind of out of the blue. Most often I got this, I'm, I'm already saved, I'm already saved, I'm already saved. But I can tell you every so often I get someone who would say yes. And one guy I remember in particular, his eyes swelled up in tears. And he looked at me and he said, yes. And I prayed with him and he gave his life to Christ and it was incredibly powerful. That wasn't me. That was simply me being there at a moment he was ready to give his life to Christ. And that's what we do. We plant, we sow. And so with that kind of as a pre-sermon, welcome to our line by line, verse by verse study through the book of Acts. <laughs> this is our 42nd study in the book. We are in Acts 17, uh, one through nine. We're not gonna make it all the way through nine because I can never do that. The title of our message is Reasoning from the Scriptures or Thessalonica receives the life-changing gospel. Now, here we get the details about Paul's method of bringing the gospel to Jews. At the end of this chapter, we get his method for bringing the, the gospel to Gentiles. In other words, the people we're bringing the gospel to, it's going to vary between the people. We, we've got to know that. That someone may be coming out of a Catholic church. We just got to find out some information. We got to find out, do you believe you're saved because you're a Catholic or do you believe you're saved because Jesus died on the cross for you? If someone's coming out of Calvary Chapel, you kind of got to do that same thing. Listen, are you believing because you go to Calvary Chapel? You think you're a Christian because you go to Calvary Chapel? You think God's up in heaven going, which church? <laughs> Calvary Chapel? Get on in there. You're, you're, the, you're, the right, you're the right one. No, you have, to, you have to have a relationship with Christ. It's a reunion to him. So we just got to do some work and find out who, who, who are we talking to? And, and what kind of things do I need to share? Is this someone who's ever been exposed to the gospel? Have seeds ever been planted or haven't they? We're going to see that here in this chapter. Now in Acts 17, 1, it says, Now when they had passed through 
Amphilius and came to Apollo Ania. And I read those much better last night, I promise. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue for, of the Jews. Now, maybe they didn't have synagogues in those two places, but now they come to Thessalonica and there's a synagogue. Now, this is important to Paul because Paul's a Pharisee. Paul's a rabbi. In a synagogue is a place people talk about God. And so he's like, this is his plan. This is perfect for him. He wants to go into a synagogue and he wants to talk about the Christ, the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. And so here's what it says. Where there was a synagogue of the Jews, then verse two, then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Circle, it was his custom. Paul had a custom on how to share Christ with Jewish people. He would go into their synagogues and he would reason from the scriptures, this is the Old Testament, that Jesus suffered, died, and rose again, and it was foretold in the Old Testament. That was his custom. It worked. That's how he planted. That's how he sowed. And some, God gave the increase to. And he did that everywhere he went. Now, what I want to ask you is, do you have a custom for sharing Christ with people? You're, I've already established a point. You're an ambassador. You're the light of the world. You have the Holy Spirit with you. Do you have a custom? First of all, people have to know you're a Christian. Do the people around you know? Do your friends, families, coworkers, and acquaintances know you're a believer? This has to be part of your system. Now that's a corporation word. That's a business word. When, when a business wants to take, a, a, let's say a franchise, wants to take one business to another place and, and duplicate their franchise, they put systems in place to make that happen. So as believers, we need to share our faith. We have to have systems of sharing our faith. One of those systems is people have to know you're a Christian. If they don't know you're a Christian, how are they ever going to ask you for the hope that's in you if they don't know? So people will come. This has happened on multiple occasions over the years. People will come up to me as, as a couple of people and they'll say, we got to tell you a story. We've worked at the same place for 10 years and both of us have come to the church here for 10 years and we just found out. We didn't know. We're working together. We don't know we go to the same church. And I want to say that's not a good thing. <laughs> that's not a funny thing. We, we got to let people know we're Christians. Well, how do you do that? Well, it depends on you. It's all going to be different. Some of you guys are bold. You, you'll wear a shirt. Jesus is my savior. And a hat that says he can be yours too. <laughs> You're just bold everywhere you go. For other people, it's a little harder. It's a little harder for you. You're just not that outgoing of a person. And so it's a little more difficult for you. But God's called you and has gifted you uniquely. But you got to let people know. Now, one of the ways that I evangelize. Now, of course, I evangelize here. And you guys water, you guys plant, and I give people an opportunity and God gives the increase. Okay? And that happens a lot. People get saved here a lot. But one of the things that I do during the week and people are going to roll their eyes at this. I know, I know, but I'm just telling you. One of the ways I get to know people who don't know the Lord is I play golf. Now people say, you play golf so you can evangelize? Good one, Pastor Robert. <laughs> Me too. I play golf so I can evangelize. But it really is true. I'll get paired with people who don't know who I am and don't know Christ. And I found that if I, this is my system. This is my custom. I'll just get to know them. What's your name? How long you been in Tucson? Are you retired? Where'd you work at? Where'd you retire from? Do you have children? Do you, you go to, and inevitably, they'll finally ask me. Now, some guys might not ever do it because they don't, just don't care. And I'm not looking to ask questions just so I can share my faith. I'm genuinely making friendships. I'm genuinely becoming their friend. So that if I play with them three or four times, I introduce them, I can say, this is my friend. John, that's what I want. I'm not, this isn't me manipulating them. This is me genuinely getting to know them. Inevitably, they're going to say, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm pastor. And, and then I'm able to ask a lot of questions. I'm able to say, were you brought up in church? Do you go to church today? Do you believe there's life after death? 
what do you think happens when you die? That gives me, like Paul's role as a, as a rabbi was unique. I have a unique role that it's not that awkward for me as a pastor to be asking that question because they're like, that's what we expect them to do. Another thing that I like to do on the golf course is cussing is a normal thing on the golf course, all right? Those of you guys that play golf, right? People will miss a 35 foot putt and then cuss and throw their putter down. And I'm like, you were, Bryson DeChambeau doesn't make that putt. And you're cussing because you didn't make the putt. So what I like to do is when I make the putt and it goes in, praise God. <laughs> Other people are cussing and I'm like, thank you, Jesus. And here's what I get on the golf, you know, on the green. I get this. People, they're more accustomed to cussing. Somebody, you dirty, rotten mustard. They're used to that. And I said mustard, just to make it clear, okay? You dirty, rotten mustard. And people will be like, yeah, uh -huh, uh huh But praise Jesus. And they're like. They just don't know how to handle it. There are ways, bumper stickers are not bad. It's a good start. But there are ways for you to let people know that you are a Christian. And praising him isn't a bad thing. When, when something good happens in your life and you say, praise, praise the Lord. People are going to know. When you say, when something good happens to you and you say, I am blessed. You're telling people that you're a Christian. When I'm, when I'm watching football and I see the football players stand up and go, we, we were just blessed to get this win. I'll go Christian. Because a non-Christian says, we were lucky the other team played well. We got the win. But a Christian says, we're blessed to get this win. The other team played well. So it's our terminology. We begin to let people know that we're a believer. You've got to have something. Now, when that happens, opportunities are going to arise. They're going to go through some crisis. So I worked at a place in Albuquerque called Murphy Dorn, and I worked there for a year and a half. And I had my own section because I did auto upholstery for them, and I headed up the auto upholstery department. I, I founded it and headed it up. They did a lot of other things. And I made relationships I shared with everyone who was there in that year and a half with Christ. But there was one guy I didn't share with. The door never opened up. And like I said, kicking the door open to share your faith doesn't really work. So right when I'm, I'm, I'm now leaving, I'm going to go start my own business. And I'm leaving that business. And um, that day, this guy comes in and says, can I talk to you? And I'm, we're standing around upholstery tables. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, my wife's leaving me. I don't know what to do. And I was able to share Christ with him. I was able to pray with him. Just for a year and a half, he knew I was a believer. This guy was a harasser. When we leave the parking lot on Friday night, they'd all be huddled around drinking beer Friday night. Woo, we're going out, you know, drinking beer. When, when this guy learned I was a Christian, he would throw a beer to me when I would walk out. He'd toss me a beer. I would either catch it or not because I'm not very athletic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And throw it back. And finally, he comes to me when he's got a crisis. How are they ever going to be able to go to you if they don't know? So you've got to find a way to let people know you're a Christian. You've got to live Christ out loud. Now, next week, we're going to see that there's a price to this. There's a price when you live Christ out loud. People are going to think you are one of those stupid Christians. You are don't believe in evolution. You, 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 they're going to believe that. Christians are the coolest, most wonderful people on the earth, said nobody ever. <laughs> you realize that they mocked Christ and they will mock you because of Christ. Amen. So what I'm asking you to do and what I'm telling you God really wants you to do is it comes with a price. But Jesus told you about it. He said, blessed are you when they persecute you for my name's sake. And when they hate you, don't be surprised because they hated me first. And they don't hate you, they hate me. So as we represent Christ, we know there's a price to pay. That's next week. And we'll get into that next week in more detail. But listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15. He said, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now the word sanctify, it simply means make things right between you and God. Make sure that you always have things right. Keep short accounts with God. If there's some unconfessed, unforgiven sin in your life, then get rid of it, confess it, 
If you're struggling with a stronghold, with a behavioral issue that you keep returning to, this happens with Christians. Example, Samson. Okay, other examples in the Bible of men that just had struggles. Then ask God to help you. Ask him to forgive you. At the moment you ask him to forgiveness, you are sanctified before God. So here, here Peter says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and listen to this and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready to give an answer to those who ask. This is why I don't have to kick open doors. This is why I don't have to force a conversation with someone. I just have to live my life before them in Christ. And someone says to me, why do you believe in Christianity over all the other religions in the world? This is a common question from people in the world. Once you start letting them know, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, they're gonna say, well, what about Hinduism? There's a lot of people in India that are Hindus. What about Islam? It's the second largest religion in the world. So why do you think Christianity is above them? So I say, because I have the Bible that's a unique book. The Quran isn't this. The writings of Hinduism isn't this. This is full of prophecy. This has manuscript evidence. And if you wanna know why that's important, I'll share it with you. But I've done my homework to know how I can defend what I believe when I'm asked. You need to be able to do that. Quite frankly, some of you aren't ready to do that. And maybe that's why God hasn't brought anybody to ask. You need to make sure you can defend yourself. This means you gotta do your homework. There's a lot available now. I'll give you some resources at the end of this study, but there's a lot that's available that you can answer questions. I wanna do a series on answering questions people ask today, where we'll just take one question per week. If it takes us 15 weeks to go through it, we'll go 15 weeks through it. So we can see what the Bible has to say to help equip you so that you can answer those questions when they're asked you, because you've got to be ready. And once you get, once you get, once you get loaded, you're gonna be like, I'm ready to get, no, that not loaded, but once you get loaded <laughs> with the gospel, then you're gonna be amazed at how you're able to share because people are gonna ask you. And don't let anybody put that heavy burden on you that you have to get people saved or that you gotta kick some door open to be able to share your faith. All, 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 I'm ready everywhere I go. That's all you gotta be. You gotta say to him, Lord, I'm ready. Lord, I know how good I'll be at it, but I'm ready. I'm, you bring someone to me and I'll share. You got the Holy Spirit with you. You got the Holy Spirit empowering you. You're an ambassador. You, you're the light of the world. So now someone asks you. Now, how exactly did Paul do it? Look at verse three. Paul goes to the synagogue, reasoning with him for three weeks in a row, three Saturdays in a row. Then it says, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus that I preach to you is the Christ. Remember, he was reasoning with them from the scriptures that Jesus suffered and died and rose from the dead. So one of the things that you can prove from the scriptures is that Jesus died for your sins according to the Torah, the Old Testament and that he rose from the dead according to the Torah, the Old Testament. I want to read you a passage, and I'll need to do this quicker than I, than I wanted to, but I want you to hear this is Jesus in the Old Testament. Now, Jewish people today will say Isaiah 53 is, is Israel, the suffering servant. But let me just say up front, Israel can't be the suffering servant. Because as we read through here, we're going to read a spot where it says, no deceit was found in his mouth and no, something like no sin at all. Israel had deceit found in their mouth and they sinned. They're just like us. So Israel cannot be the suffering Messiah. If you take this passage and read it and wherever it says he, meaning the suffering, the suffering servant, if you put the name Israel in there, it works in some places, but other places you realize this cannot be it. So when someone tells you, well, Israel is the suffering Messiah of Isaiah 53, you can go, just mark a verse, highlight it, and go to them and say, the suffering servant never had any deceit. You telling me Israel never had any deceit? It also says he was cut off from the land of the living. Israel was scattered, but they were not cut off from the land of the living. But the Messiah was. So I put that aside. I'm not going to talk about that. I did last night. I'm not going to talk about that as I read through this. I just want you to see what they thought. Now, 
the, in Jesus' time, Paul's time, they believed that this was a messianic passage. Today it's denied by Jews that's messianic. But historically, it hasn't been. This is fairly new, they say, it's, it's Israel. This is considered to be the Messiah. So when Paul would go in and say, Jesus suffered and died under Pontius Pilate and rose from the dead on the third day, and there are people alive that have seen it. So here's, here's what it is, it's 10 verses. Uh, Isaiah 53, one. Who has believed our report? And on whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender shoot, as a root out of the ground, and has no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He looked just like a normal person. That's what it means. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, I'm so sorrowful I could die. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he bore our sorrows, carried our griefs. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Transgression and iniquities is other words for sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to their own way and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now here's where again the suffering servant doesn't fit. I know I said I wouldn't talk about that, but all we like sheep have gone astray. Who is that? That's Israel as well. That's where Israel is here. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, but God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. It doesn't fit God. No, God never laid on Israel the iniquity of us all. God laid upon Christ the iniquity of us all. Then I'll go back to the line. He was opposed and he was afflicted. Excuse me. He was oppressed. He was opposed as well, but that's not what it says. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before the shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare to his generation, for he was cut off from the land of the living. They took him from Gabbatha to Galgatha. Remember what Gabbatha is? The place of the pavement where Pilate washed his hands. It was where they condemned people. They took him from prison and judgment and they cut him off from the land of the living. That's in the end of verse eight. For he was cut off from the land of the living. He died. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. That's what I was talking about with Israel. Can, has Israel never done any violence? Was there never any deceit in their mouths? Christ, them, yes, them, no. And not because they're horrible, because we're just like them. Because they're just like us. In Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile, male or female, rich or poor. We're all the same. And so in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. A seed is something you plant and you see later on. He's going to see a seed. He shall prolong his days. That's the resurrection. This one cut off from the land of the living is going to prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. He's going to see what was the labor of his soul. He made his soul a sacrifice for sin. Now he, the suffering servant, sees the labor of his soul and is satisfied. When he sees people getting saved, he rejoices and is satisfied. But his, by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. The suffering servant will justify many for he will bear their iniquities. Now, what is the result of this? Verse four, and some of them were persuaded. Not all of them, some of them. We will be successful. Listen, don't think that you're gonna plant and water and not see it happen. Go out and plant seeds and start watering them. What's gonna happen? You're gonna see plants grow. You plant and water for the gospel, people are going to get saved. Not all of them, but you will be successful. And that's why the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against you. It's going to be successful. And then it says, and a great multitude of devout Greeks, these are Gentiles who believed in the Messianic God and not a few of the leading women. 
So women got saved. Remember, in the Roman Greek world, women were a little more than a slave. The father in a Roman empire had the right of infanticide. He could kill a baby that was born in his, his family. He had that right. Mostly it was women, children, uh, girls who were killed. Just like today, mostly girls are aborted. But they had the right of that. God came in and took all of that away. Slaves, mostly slaves got saved. And then Roman leaders got saved. And religious leaders got saved. As I said, Jews and Greeks, men and women, slave and free. God broke down all of those barriers. Now, let me give you three thoughts in closing. Number one, I have to go by a lot of things I plan to say I'm not saying. Number one, you are a chosen representative of Christ wherever you go. And you are not alone. You not only have the Holy Spirit with you, but Hebrews 1.14 says you have angels who minister to us as we're doing the work of the gospel. There's a spiritual realm and you are not alone. Number two, look for ways to make your own customs to plant and water seeds. What works for me won't necessarily work for you. What worked for Paul won't work for me. But find your own way to let people know that you, you love Jesus. Know that you're doing that to win friends and hopefully bring them into the kingdom. And there's going to be a cost we're going to talk about next week. But I'm willing to, I'm willing to give up. I'm willing to pay that price. And finally, be a diligent student to be able to answer the questions that are asked of you. Now, I'm going to give you five books that you can read or you can download and listen to on Audible when you're doing housework or driving or whatever you're doing. You can listen to it. And, and I'm going to give you these fast, but later on, you can go to our YouTube page and then in the notes for this teaching, we're going to have all the scriptures I went over, plus we're going to have these books there. You can buy them, you can read them, you can listen to them, whatever you want to do. But what you're doing is throwing paint on the wall with these books. You're just getting answers and you're, you're learning how to answer questions. And sooner or later, the wall gets painted, right? By the way, if you're throwing paint on a wall, it's not going to be a pretty wall in the end. All right? But it does happen. So these are the five books I want to give you. These are just suggestions to begin preparing yourself to answer questions. Number one is called Christian Apologetics by Dr. Norman Geisler. He's gone on to be with the Lord, but this book is very powerful. Another one, Dave Hunt, who's also gone on to be with the Lord, a book called In Defense of the Faith. Again, a good read. It's going to give you a lot of good information. Then Josh McDowell, who's still with us, wrote a book called Beyond Belief and Convictions. Again, good book, a lot of good information. Elisa Childers, who's been with here, us here with us before, she wrote a book called Another Gospel, and she covers modern day questions that are brought up today and how we answer those questions. Questions about sexuality, about transgender. She'll cover things like about the inspiration of scripture. She'll cover those kind of things. And then I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Dr. Norman Geisler and Dr. Frank Turek. And Frank, of course, is a friend of ours. He's been here, but this is going to be a very good book for you. Now, as I said, drive and read them. I had a gal come up last night and say, give me those books again. I'm going to go on an 18-hour road trip. I'm going to listen to them while I'm driving. That's redeeming the time right there. That's what you want to do. Redeem the time to do the best that you can possibly do. But may God fill you with the Spirit. This is not hard. This is easy because it's Him doing the work. And you are planting and watering and trusting that God's going to bring people to Christ because of you. And like a farmer that plants and waters, he gets a crop. There will be a crop. One day you will be standing in heaven and you will have people who will greet you because you planted and you watered. Only God saves, but we all plant and we all water. Stand with me, would you, and let's pray together. Father, thank you for the time that we're able to spend here together with your word. We do pray, Lord, that we would, we would have a custom for bringing people to Christ. We do know that we are your ambassadors and we pray that we would be filled with your spirit and used by you. And we thank you for this in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.